know that you're you're here. Oh, what? Are we starting over? <laughs> we can. <laughs> we currently have zero active viewers, it says. 19 now. Okay. So do, do we need to so I'm still I'm still seeing the 39 next to the client the session title. Folks, if you're coming in, could you just let us know in the chat if you are here and hearing us? Excellent. The feed just started for people, so we're going to do the introductions again. The room just opened. Okay, excellent. All right. Thank you, everyone, for communicating that. Well, I'm glad I got to rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. The feeds are starting, so we're gonna go ahead. We're gonna go ahead and get started because I know that we're short on time. Uh, welcome everyone to climate change and militarism, exploring the connections and advocating for solutions. My name is Derek Weston. I am the theological education and training coordinator for Creation Justice Ministries. Uh, I want to very quickly uh, introduce our two panelists who are going to be sharing with us today. Um, Faith Gay is the Senior Government Relations Associate at Win Without War, a progressive U.S. foreign policy organization. She works with policymakers, organizations, and activists to advocate for more peaceful, just, and diplomatic policies related to a wide variety of issues, ranging from reducing Pentagon emissions to abolishing nuclear weapons. She's written for WWW's newsletter and has been most recently published in Inkstick, writing on the human and environmental cost of nuclear weapons and what we owe to communities harmed by them. Faith envisions a world where the most vulnerable communities are at the center of U.S. foreign policy decision-making and their needs are prior prioritized over profit and power. She holds a BA in International Studies from American University in Washington, D.C. Hello, Faith. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us. And Mark Douglas. Mark Douglas is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA and professor, professor of Christian Ethics at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, where he directs the Master of Theology degree program. He is the founding editor of At This Point, Theological Reflections on Church and Culture, the seminary's online journal, and the author of numerous books, including Confessing Christ in the 21st Century, Believing Aloud, Reflections on Being Religious in the Public Sphere, Christian Pacifism for the Environmental Age, and Modernity, the Environment, and Just War Tradition. He's currently working on a new book, War in a Warming World, Religion, Resources, and Refugees. He is married to the Reverend Dr. Lindsay Armstrong, who's also a PCUSA minister, and they have one daughter, Logan, who's a doctoral student in museum studies at St. Andrews University in Scotland. Um, welcome, Mark. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for your time and expertise. Um, so we're, we're going to jump right in uh, to this conversation. And I think the, the first thing we want to do is talk about um, the connection between uh, militarism and climate change, because uh, I don't know that that's necessarily a natural connection that people make. So um, I'd like to kind of hear both directions from both of you. Um, how are environmental changes shaping the causes, types, and understandings of conflict of war in the 21st century? And what role does militarization and violence play in these environmental changes? So I'd like to hear kind of from both standpoints, um, how, is how are environmental changes uh, affecting war and how is militarization um, playing into our environmental changes? So um, Mark, why don't we start with you? Sure, glad to. Um, great to be with you all and thanks Derek and um, Faith, a pleasure to be on this panel with you. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that uh, large-scale violence war and climatic events have always been linked with each other, although we've not paid attention to the fact that they're connected to each other for at least modern, in at least modern history, kind of since the 1600, say. Um, and part of what that reveals is that um, our modern lenses are blind to the intersections between the natural and the political. So how does that manifest in the 21st century as we move further into what some 
folks are calling the Anthropocene and what I prefer to think of as the environmental age. Um, climate change, uh, catastrophic loss of biodiversity, explosive growth of pollutants, all are having an impact on how, why, um, what we're doing when we are fighting. And there are kind of some obvious ways that this manifests, right? Um, when you're facing desertification, especially among, uh, in areas where persons are already in oppressed or positions where they don't have a lot of access to resources and desertification removes resources even more from them, the likelihood of violence goes up. This connection between climate events and violence was um, hypothesized, has been hypothesized for a while, but there wasn't clear evidence that this was the case um, until about 15 years ago when a group of scholars were able to draw connections between changes in um, and so the uh, El Nino system and violence in Central America. And they were able to uh, show a direct correlation between changes in, in, in El Nino and causes of violence. Since then, the possibilities or the range of uh, forces that are driving um, or can drive or shape violence are growing. So not only in desertification, but um, droughts and floods, um, ocean acidification, uh, movement of peoples uh, from one place to another. All of these things can be contributors toward or exacerbators of violence and on rare occasions could actually lead to violence where they're not yet. Um, even to note the most uh, large scale uh, condition of violence right now in the, U in the world is probably Ukraine and Russia, but there are environmental factors that were driving that as well. And we can talk about those at some later point, but I wanna give Faith some time here. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, you know, to to talk about this from a governmental perspective, you know, uh, governments around the world are recognizing they're going to have to shift uh, how they approach conflicts. Um, how whether they do that effectively, though, is a big question. So, you know, I'll speak today. I know the U.S. government the best, and so I'll speak to you know what that history has looked like, what the Pentagon's history of engaging climate change has looked like a little bit. Um, you know, uh, this. The Pentagon back going back to the 90s with the Kyoto Protocol uh, made it pretty clear that you know they didn't want it's they didn't want their actions, military leaders' actions and decisions in the field, and the consequences of those actions, missions-wise, to be um, highlighted and and really discussed openly. Um, and so you know when it came to creating international agreements like the Kyoto Protocol, we're supposed to commit you know governments to you know, reducing emissions and, and sort of trying to, you know, save the planet when, you know, after, you know, decades of environmental activism, governments finally agreed that they should be doing more to save the planet. Military emissions were excluded. And that was a decision that was lobbied heavily for by the United States government. Um, and so what we know is that uh, militaries have recognized that they, militaries know that their emissions are, are, heavily contributing to the global warming of the planet. Um, but there's there's tension there between uh, whether they actually want to reduce emissions and whether uh, US leadership or, or other foreign government leadership is committed to making them part of the solution to the problems we're facing. And so just to give more history, you know, post Kyoto Protocol, right? Like, um, the only time where the United States government and the U.S. military really acknowledged uh, that they were explicitly contributing to climate change or explicitly had a role in um, fighting climate change was when Obama came into office. He basically demanded that the Department of Defense stop denying um, climate change and, and switch tactics. Um, and so, but what they did is instead of you know, necessarily going forth and saying, you know, we should do all these things to reduce emissions. They said, well, you know, climate change is going to cause rising sea levels, so we have to change bases and get funding and investment in that. Um, climate change is going to cause climate refugees, and so we have to prepare for attacks on the border. And suddenly, you know, when we talk about militarization, um, we see climate change presented as this threat that needs to be met with uh, increased amounts of weapons for the Pentagon with increased amounts of funding for the Pentagon um, to basically protect borders and, and supposedly protect bases, but not necessarily any discussion or serious discussion about 
reducing the military's contribution um, to emissions, reducing the amount of violence uh, that militaries commit and that contributes to emissions. Um, and so noting this, you know, with, with, with the amount of funding that the Pentagon receives, the U.S. military receives, it receives, receives more discretionary funding each year than any other federal agency. It's unacceptable that it's the world's largest emitter, world's largest institutional emitter of emissions. Um, there's no scenario where the United States is able to effectively meet its climate goals um, without cutting Pentagon emissions. And so, you know, uh, a lot of governments have committed to trying to keep global warming to beneath one degree Celsius, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, from pre and above pre-industrial levels. So before, you know, in the industrial revolution and, and uh, you know, kind of that key, the key points in history where human induced like emissions and contrib contributions to global warming become more significant. Um, but, you know, we're fastly approaching that limit. We could approach it in, within the next five years. And so uh, all to say, when we talk about how, how militarization has contributed to climate change, how um, what's really required for us to protect the planet and protect ourselves most effectively, uh, would just emphasize that we need governments to shift their perspectives from one of hostility um, uh, towards being more transparent and being uh, and reducing, you know, the amount of violence they commit to one that's significantly focused on recognizing climate change has no borders. Um, our investments need to be in uh, not just like protecting equipment or protecting militaries, but in protecting refugees, in protecting um, waterways, in protecting, you know, the vast amount <laughs> of other more critical and pressing things um, than we're currently doing right now. Derek, can I jump in just to kind of um, reiterate something Faith said that I really appreciate? She she highlighted an irony, right? The the irony that the, the military is uh, a huge emitter of greenhouse gases, even as it is also in its quadrennial defense reviews, arguing that climate change is a threat multiplier and one of the biggest concerns it faces in the 21st century. So it's it's creating the conditions that um, it is worried about along the way. Um, I actually like the fact that it helps us see that climate is a security issue, partly because it that breaks down um, unhelpful binaries about who cares about climate and who doesn't. Um, at the same time, um, pressure forward to overcome that irony and to get um, militaries to start to think more consistently about how their patterns of behavior um, need to address some of the very problems that they're most concerned about. Um, that needs to get foregrounded a lot more than it has been. I'd like to think that there's kind of some um, political leverage there that's available. Uh, whether or not that leverage is as strong as we would like it to be is a different question. Very quickly, I'd like to I'd like to ask you both: beyond militaries, what other institutions of the state further militarism and impacts on climate? Ooh, I'll take this one. Um, well, uh, the key the key institution that comes to mind for me is law enforcement. Um, both at the state and local level. Um, you know, we've seen law enforcement in both recent and past history demonstrate that they're willing to use weapons and tactics of war against people in the U.S. who are fighting to protect the planet. Um, you know, the most recent news or the most recent, you know, big news that we've seen is out of Cop City uh, in Atlanta. Um, uh, the activist Tor Tortuguita from Honduras um, was killed protesting Cop City, um, was shot unarmed in cold blood by law enforcement 57 times, um, and they were murdered while nonviolently standing against forest destruction and infringement of indigenous land for the sake of building a police training facility. You know, and, and beyond that, you know, only a few years ago, we were seeing protesters against the Dakota Access oil pipeline, a lot of whom were also indigenous people, um, being violently arrested, beaten, tear gassed, um, and mind you, tear gassing civilians is, a, is like a war crime in any other, <laughs> according to international law, it's not considered that in the United States, but 
if it happened in another country, we would consider it a war crime. Um, so, you know, noting that it's it's crucial for us to recognize and oppose militarism in all its forms because climate activists' lives are increasingly at risk. Um, and we need that activism uh, when governments are failing to step in, when they're, they're tolerating oil pipelines being built uh, and threatening, you know, people's land. A couple other places I would um, just throw in. I mean, I think Faith names uh, a primary one, um, but also um, any of the governmental organizations that are focused on um, refugees and immigrants need to pay more attention to these type of things. Um, it be, because if they build a vision of outsider as threat, it's likely to exacerbate rather than address some of the tensions that are created by climate refugees. Um, another one, though, that's a little bit less attended to is uh, government regulation with regard to food production. Um, mm. As long as um, food production tends toward large agribusiness, um, you are risking certain systems uh, of um, and losing biodiversity and loss of biodiversity can and will lead to um, occasions where violence is more likely as if some type of crop fails. So there are, there are forces in... U.S. government systems that uh, maybe need to pay more attention than they have, not because of necessarily what's going on right now, but because of the implications of what could happen if they're not changing their policies now. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that. You're helping us collect, connect a lot of important dots here. And I want to shift our focus now to thinking about that kind of policy making. Um, and if we accept that mitigating climate change is the is the greatest national security issue of our lifetime, and, and I think we that's that's pretty easy to argue here how should that transform the way policymakers create foreign and defense policy um well i'm happy to jump in i think you know first and foremost it's important to acknowledge that you know the challenge we're going to meet in terms of trying to mitigate climate change won't be solved by minuscule changes. Um, it's going to require some pretty substantial ones. You know, we've seen, you know, there's often an emphasis on on what the individual can do um, instead of like larger whole scale like government approaches. Um, some some suggestions I've seen come out of government or, or in past like, discussions about what the military could do involve like banning single use plastics on bases or, or using like battery powered Humvees. And those are all good and worthwhile, but when we talk about what at least the US military needs to do in order to really, really get truly in this fight and, and serious about climate change, um, when we're talking about reducing military operations um, and potentially base closure. Um, and so, you know, it's important to acknowledge military operations uh, are responsible for like 62% of the US military's energy consumption. Most of that is from jet fuel, so from the planes the military uses to transport troops from equipment, troops and equipment from base to base. Um, so when we're running operations in the Middle East, like the Iraq War, like the Afghanistan War, right? When, when um, we're doing things like maybe considering building up bases in the Philippines, you know, as a suppose as a maybe an idea about you know, shoring up security in, in, count, in counterance to like China. Um, those are all things that have emissions costs and they're substantial. Um, uh, the, the impacts of the, the forever wars of the 2000s are, are quite substantial. Um, and so all of that means that when policymakers are making decisions about how they want to involve the U.S. in conflict or in mili about U.S. military decisions, so like also about like their U.S. military alliances, about base maintenance and creation, about weapons manufacturing. Um, all of those factors should influence, uh, all of those factors should be considered. And then policymakers should be thinking about what are the emissions costs of doing those things? Um, will making those decisions ultimately affect the US's ability to fight climate change? And I think for, for you know, activists and, and advocates like the audience we have, you know, it's really important for y'all, when you're engaging policymakers, when you have your elected representatives ear, um, to be inquiring, you know, what are you doing to, to cut military missions? What are you doing to, to require the military to be more heavily involved in the fight to fight climate change? Um, 
you know, how are you reconsidering what foreign policy decisions are made based on whether they are going to help us avoid going over that one and a half degree Celsius limit, avoid, you know, the rising sea levels and the heat waves and the extreme droughts um, and all those other factors that, you know, we're really at a tipping point for experiencing in more severe ways. Um, I'll stop there uh, because I want to give Mark a chance. But yeah, happy to talk about this more. Um, and and Faith and kind of where she works uh, is is at uh, much more kind of immediate levels. Um, yes. I am going to rather audaciously throw us up to 30,000 or 60,000 or 100,000 feet um, here and, and make this kind of a big argument that um, part of what we're facing is a, a change in our social imaginary, um, mm -hmm. that the modern social imaginary just is not equipped to address even understanding some of these types of causes of understandings of what we're facing in the 21st century because it was so framed to separate out the political and the natural and to make war a form of politics by other means that it can't imagine how to engage differently. Now, um, I think actually this changing social imaginary, a change in worldview, if it were, as you were, um, is inevitable. There's no way, there's no way that I can imagine that environment won't become not only an issue among issues, but a lens through which we make sense of all issues, including matters of mm -hmm. violence. And as we transition out of one social imaginary into another, I think, I hope, at least based on experience, we're going to discover new ways of not only imagining, but put new practices into place or take current practices and reimagine how to pursue them in ways that are functional for the new times that we live in. Um, this is really abstract, so let me kind of give a, a, a kind of a concrete example. The modern social imaginary has been shaped by and large by economic metaphors. So that not only are we thinking about the market in our economy, but market language shapes our social societies, right? Um, how do, what do we do with time? We save it and spend it. Um, when doctors are being trained about how to do ethics stuff, they learn cost-benefit analysis, right? You can hear the language of the market metaphors driving even areas that, isn't, that aren't about the market. My argument is that um, as we move further into the Anthropocene, our language itself is going to change. And so our understandings of the world we live in and how to engage the world around us are going to change as well. I think one of the primary ways that will take place is that we'll recognize um, that we are shifting from priority toward um, autonomous individuals that can make individual decisions on their own and participate with each other in voluntary systems toward networks of, um, of enmeshment where what happens in one place always is having an impact on something else. Um, what, how we behave in one way can only be understood because we're part of larger social systems um, and social systems that include natural systems. I think the further we move into kind of this, this um, to use a slightly different metaphor, networked world, um, the more likely it is that we'll be, get clarity about some of the problems we're facing, but the potential for addressing some of those problems will also come uh, be brought to the fore too. Hmm. Mark, as you're speaking, I'm reminded of one of my theology professors saying that one of the things that is redeemed in the cross and in the resurrection is our imagination. And so I, as we think about this, I'm thinking about more of a, a new societal imagination and a new way forward. Um, I, I find that incredibly compelling to think of, of, of what's needing to change being the ways that we imagine and envision the world. And I really feel like the church can be a part of that. So I, as, as we um, think about these big questions, uh, I want to ask um, the question of where the church's involvement comes. And I want to, I want to frame it. Um, uh, Faith, you gave us this great question. And I want to use, I want to use your framing of this question um, because it, I, I think it really gets to the point. Um, as white supremacists invoke Christianity to attack democracy and increase the ways the state can police people with voting rights restrictions, book bans, abortion bans, drag show bans, etc., why is it important that religious communities are at the front and center of the anti-militarism movement? 
Um, yeah, happy to respond to my own question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, so many faith communities actually have a lot of the same values or are driven by many of the same values. And uh, the value that immediately comes to mind to me is, is a real focus on, you know, everyone created equal under the creator. Um, you know, a real, I, I think so many communities come from a place where their faiths emphasize a focus on peace and justice and people being made equal. And what we're seeing right now is a whole lot of action policy-wise um, and, you know, in our, in our everyday lives uh, to make people unequal. Um, and so, you know, one of the consequences of climate change is that it's not going to be felt equally among the entire population. Um, it, you know, when we talk about people being climate refugees, we already have climate refugees, right? We already have people, I'm from the state of California, right? Wildfires have created climate refugees. Um, you know, we, when we, you know, Mark was talking about, you know, uh, how there's been like militarization of, of from, you know, government agencies that, you know, handle refugees and whatnot. We've seen, you know, climate refugees from, you know, certain islands in the Caribbean who, were displaced by hurricanes, you know, arrive at the border and really have a tough experience at the U.S. border, the southern border, obviously. And so, um, you know, additionally, that, it's going to disproportionately impact Indigenous people. It disproportionately impacts um, women. It disproportionately impacts the global south, so people outside of the U.S. and Europe, um, you know, and uh, because historically um, countries in the global south have contributed the least to climate change, the least emissions, um, and yet you have islands that are being threatened with being flooded and in, into like non-existence. You have um, people in the Sahel and Africa facing extreme drought. Um, and so, you know, noting that uh, we're also seeing in the U.S. communities of color in particular on the front lines of climate justice fighting, you know, petrochemical companies, um, but at the same time, they're also having to fight police abuse. They're having to fight, you know, white supremacist vigilante violence. They're fighting at Cop City. They're fighting at the border. They're fighting in Flint, right? And so it should be noted that all of those fights, when they're focusing on all those things, they don't have, it creates less time and less energy to focus on fighting climate change. When we're splintered into fighting all of these separate fights and rendering people into separate but equal status, Basically, um, we impact their ability to fight climate change while also noting that they are going to be the most at risk of being impacted by it. And so you're really compounding the amount of marginalization people are feeling. Um, and I'll just note, you know, from a legislative perspective, you know, I think I've been thinking heavily about, you know, the extremists um, we saw in Tennessee try to expel two black legislators from their from their body. Um, and, you know, if legislators are comfortable defying the will of the people, right, what incentive do they have to fight for climate change on a legislative level, level and set policy that really is going to determine where we go, right? We can make as many individual changes as we want, but we need policymakers invested in what we do, right? What incentive do they have if they feel like they can disenfranchise the communities that need a legislative climate intervention the most? And so... Um, what this has to do with people of faith, like I said, I think people of faith have been at this, you know, are so motivated by a lot of the same values. But beyond that, they've been at the center of political movements that have absolutely changed this country and the world. Um, they've been the moral center for, you know, really transformational pol political movements. And they've also seen, you know, their values invoked, particularly in Christianity here in the United States, invoked to justify violence towards communities um, and to justify exclusion. And so what we need right now is people saying, you know, you cannot be attacking women's rights. You cannot be attacking queer people's rights. You cannot be attacking, you know, civil rights, Black people's rights, the right to vote, the right to have duly elected representatives, um, because we need them in our coalition, you know, because they are as just as, you know, they're made just as equal as I. And so, you know, noting that 
I think it's important that we remember um, a lot of this is distraction. A lot of this, um, when when we know that this is the fight of our lives, you know, policymakers have a choice to do something different, and it's it's imperative that faith communities are you know at the center of holding these people to the fire. That's what I would say. <laughs> well said. Um, thanks, Faith. Uh, that's that's rich and um, really ominous when you start to think about um, the the way democracies are under attack because. Um, I think, you know, my first answer to this question has always been the most important thing people of faith can do um, to address these matters is vote. You know, before mm. recycling, before reducing the voting is the most important thing you can do. The trick is if votes are being marginalized um, or being disallowed or being packed, then the, effect, the efficacy of voting um, diminishes until such point as it could actually be cease to be a functional way forward. So... Um, oh, and by the way, when I tell people to vote, like, it's not just vote. Don't just vote your pocketbook. That's pretty happy. Or don't even vote your conscience. I want to know what's forming your conscience before I decide it's a good idea for you to vote your conscience. <laughs> vote your grandchildren. Vote your great-grandchildren's future. If you can do that. If you can have a long-term vision of politics, I think you're in, we're, we're in a better place. So um, I keep saying voting and then struggling with uh, the attacks on democracy and their implications for us here. Um, I would say this. Um, I've named kind of the, the separation of the natural and the political was the one of the chief manifestations of modernity. Um, I think the other chief expression of modernity was the separation of religion into the private realm, right? Public and private. And um, some groups, some faith groups have never really bought into that. And they have been pretty happy to bring their religious language into public settings. They've been pretty happy to bring their religious convictions into public settings and try and um, weaponize them to achieve per particular goals. The, the, the problem with that isn't so much, in my opinion, that they are bringing religion into public settings. It's that the religion they're bringing into public settings isn't adequately being critiqued either from within or from without because we have such an emaciated way of understanding religion in public sphere. What we need is richer ways of understanding and being religious in public spheres, not lesser ways or fewer ways. We need to get away from a vision of the secular um, as a driver for how we engage the world around us. Um, to go back to 30, 60, 100,000 feet, I actually think that's inevitable. And one of the ways it's going to be inevitable is something that faith named, which is the movement of peoples, because that separation of public and private or of religion into private sphere is incoherent in much of the world. And as peoples interact with each other, we're seeing them bringing kind of their own rich understandings about how to engage their faith and society in ways that don't look like what traditional moderns did, um, which included um, as faith has named kind of the manifestation of significant levels of, of, of racism and white supremacy, because another part of the move to modernity was, um, and the, and the move to kind of, um, letting the market drive how we understood and thought was to turn certain people into commodities. Um, and we're still not recovered from that. Hmm. So I still want to say vote is the most important thing you can do. But the second most important thing you can do is um, work through your own religious communities to defend and make richer the possibility of voting mattering. If I could just respond to that for a second, I think that's a great point, Mark. Um, and it, we have real, like I said, religious communities have been mm -hmm. part of political movements. So we have real life examples of what that looks like. You know, something that immediately comes to mind for me, someone who works on nuclear weapons policy is you had nuns and priests and people of faith chained to, to nuclear weapons um, production sites, to nuclear power sites. Nuclear power is different than, than it's a separate issue. But, you, you know, you had people willing to be arrested and really, um, you know, um, thrown in jail uh, in order to, you know, show that they were serious about this issue. And they were willing to create high profile public moments to be, um, you know, visibly uh, chastised and, and degraded um, by law enforcement as they were doing these things um, in order to grab people's attention and, and remind them that they needed to care about this in the voting booth um, whenever an election was coming up. And so I would say this is, I just want to reiterate, this is so possible and it is important 
for people to do this in community with other people. Um, and, and, you know, that could be through your, your local, I don't know, your local housing association, but it's also really powerful when it comes from communities of faith, like Brent was talking about. Yeah. I, in fact, to kind of reinforce what you're saying, Faith, um, I, I would defy anybody to name any massive social change in the history of the United States that did not have religious actors thinking religiously as drivers for it, whether it was abolition or civil rights or yeah. anything else. I mean, I, that's always been the reality. It's just been the narrative about those things and the religious forces that drove them has been kind of relatively discounted. Um, I, and, and, and with faith, I would say that, um, that protest and, and making one's voice very public, uh, getting a bullhorn is it can be an important thing. I think there are other things too. The creation of watchdog organizations um, mm -hmm. is really yeah. vital, um, as is um, creating alternative pathways um, where communities of faith can come in and work to um, demilitarize policing systems and work alongside in of, of kind of proper policing, as it were, in communities. The effect is not only a reduction in crime, but a, a growth in, in trust and community building um, across uh, all the, you know, kind of racial ethnic groups that are in that community. So there's a lot of things that we can do um, at, at very immediate and at larger levels as well. Hmm. We have a little bit of time left. Um, unsurprisingly, most of the questions have to do with resources. <laughs> so um, let me hit this first one of links or background info on uh, Faith. You talked a lot about migration. Um, where can people find more information about these mig migratory patterns that we're seeing um, in response to climate change and response to military action? That's a good question. Um, I'll drop one in the chat and I'll also talk a little bit about um, this resource I've been engaging. There's a book by um, a, a professor named Dr. Netta Crawford at Brown University. She runs what's called their Cost of War program. Um, and she has this book uh, that came out late last year um, called The Pentagon, Climate Change and War. Um, and she talks a bit about um, how war has like shaped migration. This is like from a paper and I think a talk she did um, uh, uh, a few years back, 2019 is what I'm saying. Um, but she talks about mass migration and, and how um, you know, the consequences of, of global warming are, are gonna drive those. Um, and so I would encourage everyone to pick up that book and look into her work in the Cost of War Project in general. Um, they've done a lot of work to estimate the, the, the financial costs of the forever wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, of the climate costs, um, the human toll. Um, and so I think that's great work to engage. I will also say my own organization. Um, I, will, I will plug them. Um, we do work to try to create um, resources for the public. If I can find our website, I will drop it here. Um, but you can always um, sign up for our newsletter. You can always sign up for our emails. What we also do is we create opportunities for people to engage through digital action. Um, and so we'll, we'll create petitions that we share with legislators or with the White House, and people can always participate that way. And sometimes we create in-person event ideas, but yes, I'll drop that in a second. Over to you, Mark. Um, yeah, um, and Faith thought she was about, she engaged in shameless self-promotion. I'll just be even more dramatic and say, um, I've got two books out right now, Pacifism for Environmental Age and Modernity of the Environment and the Christian Just War Tradition. Um, I do not recommend anybody buy them. I, I'd appreciate it if you did, but they are incredibly expensive because they're both out of Cambridge University Press. They're for libraries, they're for academics. But um, I kind of make some big arguments about this stuff throughout those books. Um, and so, you know, get your local library to buy it um, and then check it out. Um, or get your academic library to, to, to buy it and then, and then check it out. And um, there you can kind of go to the pages and pages and pages and pages of bibliography um, where I try and make some of, uh, can offer some resources. Um, the, the, que the larger question of resources um, I think is vital and that's why the subtitle of the forthcoming book is Religion, Resources and Refugees. Um, mm. Because I think um, at the level of movement of peoples and how we understand resource, um, those will be two of the, the drivers of um, 
climate-shaped crisis um, and violence, and um, potentially re re reimagining re those things can be part of the solution to or alleviation or mitigation some of the costs they're in. I'd also point, like, I've got a whole bunch of books behind me um, that are addressing um, climate and violence, only two of which are mine, right? Those, there's those two, but um, Rising Tides, I think, is a pretty good book on thinking about um, climate migrants. Um, Global Crisis uh, gives you a really rich history of a time when climate change, um, as, we, as they entered in, uh, the Little Ice Age, um, had an impact on uh, violence in Europe. Um, so there's, there's a lot of great stuff out there um, and it is proliferating. I started my project on this stuff about uh, a decade ago. Um, and when I did, I couldn't find a single source that brought together religious thought, environmental concerns, and violence. Um, and now there's bunches of it, and it's delightful to see that that's happening. So um, in some ways, if you're looking for resources, just keep your eyes open because they're proliferating. Yeah. Excellent. So we are just about out of time. Um, Faith, Mark, thank you both for your time. Um, I just want to very quickly give you the opportunity to let people know how they can get in touch with you and engage with your work as we as we wrap up. Um, for me, the, the best way is my email, um, which is public, and it's my work email at Columbia Theological Seminary. So it's um, Douglas, D-O-U-G-L-A-S, my last name, M, um, my first initial, at ctsnet.edu, um, Columbia Theological Seminary net.edu. We wanted to be cts.edu, but I think Christian Theological Seminary got to CTS before we did, so we had to add something in. We added in net, which was stupid because everybody wants a period between the um, S and the N. There's not. It's ctsnet.edu. Um, or if you just know that I went to Columbia Seminary, go to the Columbia Seminary website, and you'll be able to track me down and find that email fairly quickly. Faith, real quick. Also, email, I'll put in the chat. It's just my name at onewithoutwar.org. Um, happy, great, great talking to you all. Yes, and thank you, Derek, for moderating. Great yes. to be with Faith, yeah. Well, thank you all. We are we are being told that our session time is at an end. Um, I don't know if they're actually going to cut us off the way that they, <laughs> the way that they started us. <laughs> but Faith, um, Mark, thank you both so much for the insight. And, and again, I think um, just just the help of connecting these dots um, and and the challenge to to approach our faith communities with greater imagination. Um, to to uh, I appreciate both of you um, kind of giving a hopeful uh, approach to this of saying that yes, there is something that we can do. There are ways that we can be involved. Um, and I, so I think in these ways that are these issues that oftentimes feel so overwhelming, I think you've both kind of let us know that there are things that we and our faith communities can do. And so I, I just very much appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm convinced God is at work in the world. Um, and discerning how God is at work in the world is the most important thing that we do. And God is at work in organizations like faiths. Um, and and the reflective patterns of behavior that uh, the folks who come to ecumenical advocacy days pursue. So um, figure out what God's doing and get on board with it. God um, is working toward the flourishing of all creation. Um, so that's it for me. I think it's the best note we can leave on. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. I think that's great. <laughs> Um, so, uh, thank you everyone for, um, thank you for everyone who attended and thank you, Faith. Thank you, Mark. And, um, let's, let's keep these conversations going in our faith communities. Thank you, Derek. Thank you.